Lesson number one, group activities. Question one, part A. For example, what are the coordinates of the critical point of y equals x squared? So we know what the graph of y equals x squared looks like. And we're looking for a place where the graph is horizontal. And in this case, it happens right at the origin, right down here at that spot. And so we say that the critical point of y equals x squared is 0, comma, 0. Part B, trying to figure out how many critical points each graph, each graph has. So in this case, I see two places where the graph is flat. Uh, in this part B, the graph isn't flat any place, so that has no critical points. Part C, it's really hard to tell, but I think that this one has just one critical point right there where the graph is flat or horizontal. Part D, uh, this graph is never flat. It's always going uphill, so no critical points there. Part E, again, hard to tell, but if there's one horizontal spot in there, then there's one critical point. And then finally, part F looks like the graph turns around and is horizontal there and also there. So that one's got two. So filling in our uh, table, two, zero, one, zero, one, two. In part C, we're going to calculate the quantity uh, that's labeled as D. There's 4B squared minus 12AC. Uh, let's give it a shot for this first graph, graph A. So in this row, uh, A is the number touching X cubed, and the number touching X cubed is an invisible 1. B is the number touching X squared. That's a negative 2. Make sure you get the negative in there. C is the number touching x, that's a negative 1. And then finally, D is the constant term, that's positive 3. And so we're going to crunch all these things together into our highlighted green formula. So I'm still in row number 1. So D equals 4 times B squared minus 12 times A times C. So for A, B, and C, I just put empty parentheses. And now we're going to fill in the numbers. So this was 4 times b squared, b is negative 2, minus 12 times a, a was 1, times c, that was negative 1. And so we just carefully do the arithmetic following the order of operations. We know that we have to do exponents first, so this is 4 times 4, and then minus times minus is plus, and that's a 12. 16 plus 12 is 28. So that's the um, value of d for this first row of our table. Uh, I'm not going to show the calculations for the rest of them. You can check the answer key a couple of pages down the road. But I will point out that um, if uh, one of the terms is missing, that means there's an implied zero. So for example, for this one, uh, I can see that a is at 2. But there's no x squared term in here. And there's also no x term in here. It jumps right to the constant term. And so because there's no x squared term, b must have been 0. And because there's no x term, C must also be 0. Uh, same deal here in part F. You can see that there's a term that's missing. There's only three terms here instead of our usual four. Uh, the term that's missing is the x squared term. So that means that B must be 0 in part F. So hopefully we can make some connections between the value of D and the number of critical points. I'll just put the answer right here. So if you haven't thought about it, definitely pause the video so that you don't see the answer right away. But it turns out if D is negative, less than zero, then the graph has no critical points. And if D is equal to zero, then there's exactly one critical point. And if D is positive, anything bigger than zero, then there are two critical points. OK, number two, uh, part A, is the coldest water uh, at the top or at the bottom? Uh, so it sure feels like the cold stuff is at the bottom. Uh, if you imagine swimming around in a lake, your head and shoulders are probably pretty warm. You're the surface of the water, and then the water by your feet is often noticeably colder. When a lake begins to freeze, does it freeze from the top or the bottom? Well, it freezes from the top, right? 
do you see the contradiction given your answers to parts B and C? Well, yeah, because we said in part A that the water gets colder the further down we go, and yet the water freezes from the top. Uh, those two things do not jive. So let's see if we can resolve that here in the rest of this problem. Okay, so uh, without any technology, draw a rough sketch of this thing. So all I'm looking at is the fact that this is a T cubed equation. And I know that every cubic equation either looks like this or like this. One of those two things. Every cubic equation looks like one of those. Uh, and in this case, uh, because the leading coefficient is a negative number, it's got to look like this orange one here. And so a very rough sketch, because it's a negative and it's a cube, looks like that. If you want to be a tiny bit more precise, if t is equal to zero, then the um, volume is this 999.87. So I guess that's right there. But even that, I don't need. Just a very rough sketch here. OK, so here's some screenshots of me trying to figure out what the graph looks like more precisely than the rough sketch that we just came up with. <clears throat> you can see that in each case, uh, the x min and x max are 0 to 30. Those are the values of the temperature. And that makes sense because it said the uh, equation is only valid for temperatures between 0 degrees and 30 degrees. And so the things that change are the y min and y max. So here we're looking between uh, y min equals 0 and y max equals 10. And we see absolutely nothing in that far left graph, which makes sense because we saw that this graph uh, it touches the y-axis up there right under 1,000, 999.87. OK, so let's include 1,000 in our y range. And now uh, the graph of that cubic function looks like this, looks like a horizontal line. So clearly, we are not seeing. Uh, the behavior of this graph because the, um, the cubic is not horizontal anywhere except for maybe like two distinct points, certainly not between 0 and 30. So then uh, let's focus in our uh, y range to 800 to 1200, and it looks almost exactly the same, almost perfectly flat, but then there's this little bloop. Right here, it looks like it's one pixel higher at the end of this domain, uh, which tells us that there's more going on here than we can see. OK, in all three screenshots, the horizontal axis shows from t equals 0 degrees to t equals 30 degrees. In the leftmost graph, we see nothing. In the middle graph, we bump up the Vmax to 2,000, and the function appears to be constant. I guess if you put horizontal there, that's OK. In the right graph, we try to zoom in on the vertical axis by going from v equals 800 to v equals 1200. Graph still looks like a line, except for the slight uptick at about t equals 27. So there's something going on here we can't see just yet. OK, so here's a brand new equation. There's a quadratic equation. I can see the t squared. That makes it quadratic. And I'm setting it equal to 0. So you're not supposed to see a connection yet between that equation and the original volume formula. But the calculus that we're going to do in the next couple of weeks will hopefully make that connection clear. All of the calculus in this problem is hidden in the creation of the equation above. Uh, the degree of this equation we said is 2. So the equation is called a quadratic, which can be used solving the quadratic formula. So uh, you can check my answers later on if you want to, but you know the quadratic formula, right? x equals negative b plus or minus a big old square root, uh, the whole thing divided by 2a. But anyway, I did that work, and I got t equals 3.97 and t equals 79.53. As mentioned earlier, the v function is only valid between 0 and 30 degrees. So of the two temperatures listed above, we're ignoring the one that's outside of that domain and focusing our attention instead on the one that's in the domain. So 3.97 is what we are paying attention to right now. Let's fill in the blank in the top row with the temperature we're focusing on. I just said that was 3.97. And then fill in the blank in the bottom row by evaluating the function at t equals 0. So we've done this already, but if you plug 0 here and here and here, all that's left is this 999.87. So that's what goes here. 
and then these other y values, you can check them later on. It's not hard. It's just arithmetic that I did on the calculator by plugging 3.97 in for all of the t's and calculating this whole thing. Turns out that's 999.74. And then likewise, plug in 30 degrees for all of those t's and we get 1003.76. So uh, let's use the table to write down the dimensions of a tight window we could use to graph this function. So let's give it a shot. Uh, T min uh, is still zero and T max is still 30, but now the volumes we can see, there is not a whole heck of a lot of room between the smallest of these three numbers and the biggest of these three numbers. So let's put the smallest one as our V min. So it looks like 999.74. And the largest one is 1003.76. And that is a very tight window. Um, so uh, in the screenshots that I came up with here, I didn't go quite as tight. Um, I went 999 right here and just 1004. Just needed to be able to see 1003.76, so 1004 there. And now on the far right-hand side of these screenshots, we actually see something curvy, which makes sense because we're expecting to see something curvy. Okay, and now we're putting a dot on the three points from the table up above. So right here is zero and then the 999.87. And then the minimum point is right around here. And we discovered that that's at 3.97 and then 999.74. And then at the far right is T equals 30 degrees. And that's just 1003.76. And so I'll uh, just draw the rest of this. We said we knew this was a negative cubic. And so that meant that it had to start up here and then come down and then go up. And then at some point it's going to come back down again. But really, we only care about what's happening between 0 and 30. So then it says, what temperature water has the least volume? So it looks like that's 3.97 degrees. What temperature water has the greatest density? Greatest density. So if uh, the 3.97 degree water has the lowest volume, then it must also have the greatest density, right? It's um, the 3.97 degree temperature water. Uh, one kilogram of that water takes up the smallest possible volume, which means it is the densest water in this picture. And so this is actually exactly the same answer here. Lowest volume means greatest density. And now we can take a look at uh, how a lake freezes and why, um, uh, why this uh, 3.97, this very small change in the volumes of water around four degrees is the key to sea life. So here we go. Uh, we're gonna take a side look at a lake. So there's our side view water up here at the top. And now we're going to assume uh, that uh, this lake has five degree water. I'm, I'm going to uh, um, round this 3.97 to four degrees. We're just going to pretend that's four degrees, that, that minimum volume water. Okay, so we're going to assume that this is a pretty cold lake and all the water in here is um, uh, six degrees and five degrees and four degrees. And so I'm just going to make these little swaths here for six, five, and four. And we know that the densest water is that four degree water. And so that's at the bottom. And then slightly less dense is the five degree water. And then slightly less dense is the six degree water. And let's assume that it continues to be really cold outside. And so that coldness hits the top of the lake and gives us water that is only five degrees and four degrees. So now we have only two different kinds of temperature water here. So we've got some five degree stuff there and some four degree stuff there. And it continues to be really incredibly cold. And at some point, all of the water in the lake is going to be four degrees or 3.97. And now it is still really cold. And so the water at the top of the lake is going to become three degrees. And then we have to decide where it's going to go. So let's assume that we've got some three degree stuff and some four degree stuff. And the question is, which one is on top? Well, the densest water is the four degree stuff. So that has to sink to the bottom, which means the three degree stuff is gonna be up at the top. And then let's make it so that it continues to be really cold. 
And so now I'm going to have water that's 1, 2, 3, and 4 degrees. So 1, 2, 3, and 4. And we know that the densest stuff is the 4. That's at the bottom. Slightly less dense is 3. Slightly less dense is 2. Slightly less dense is 1 at the top. And if it continues to be really, really cold, then uh, we're going to get some stuff that's 0 degrees. And some of this water is going to turn to ice. But let's see where that happens. All right, let's suppose that now I've got some zero degree water and some one, two, three, and four. So I know that the densest stuff is four degrees. That's at the bottom. Then there's some three, some two, some one, and then some ice at the top. And I'll draw one last picture here. Even if it gets really, really cold outside, and even if the slab of ice is super thick, like let's suppose that everything above that line is ice zero degrees up here for sure i know that there's this really nice pocket of warm well, warm is relative i guess but you've got some four some three some two and some one but this really nice pocket of water down there protected because that four degree water sinks and is always sitting at the bottom of course if the lake is tiny the whole thing could freeze which is a problem for those fishies and those plants but as long as the lake is big enough and it's not too, too cold outside, there's always this really nice protected layer of four degree water at the bottom for them to live in.